these seven letters to the churches, and the first one he wrote to was Ephesus. Ephesus. That's right. And there was a whole list of stuff, which is the outline of the letters, right? So John, by the inspiration of the Spirit, with actually Jesus Christ speaking himself, assigned a description to Ephesus. Do you remember what part of his identity he gave to Ephesus? You can look. It's okay. It's an open book quiz. What was it? The loveless church. Okay, but what part of his description, of his description, did he give to the church? Him who holds. Yeah, him who holds. That's right. The stars and is in the midst of the lampstands, right? That's right. Okay. What did the Ephesian church do right? Works. 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 Good works. Mm -hmm. Patience. Patient endurance. Steadfastness. Steadfastness and sound sound doctrine. That's right. You guys are rocking this. What's their rebuke? They lost their first love, right? Okay. The threefold remedy was three R's. Remember, repent, and do what you did at first. That's right. Remember, repent, redo, or repeat, right? Three R's. Remember, repent, repeat. Okay. And the reward is? Everlasting life. Eternal life. That's right. Good job. Awesome. So that is the Ephesian church. If you missed that, uh, go on YouTube. By the way, I've been getting a lot of questions. I missed the live stream. How do I make it up? If you go on the YouTube, Rooted Path YouTube channel, there is a playlist called Dear Beloved, and everything is reposted there. So if you need it, that's where it is. Okay, so last week was called Abandoned Love. So we're going to open tonight by listening to the audio, because we're going to listen to the whole book. Okay, so we're going to listen to the letter tonight. So hit it, Chloe. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Three or four verses, that's our entire text for tonight, but there is a ton in it. So I hope you guys are awake. You guys look real awake tonight. I see it yawning already. It is uh, going to be a doozy tonight. I hope you guys are ready for that. So Smyrna is 40 miles north of Ephesus. Remember, the churches go in this like um, horseshoe kind of shape, right? So it's Ephesus. I'm doing it backwards for you guys. It's Ephesus and then Smyrna, 40 miles to the north. Smyrna in Greek, it means myrrh which was this ugly, bitter tree, but it was everywhere in Smyrna, and that's going to come into play. They, though, have self-titled themselves the crowning glory of Asia. That's what they called themselves because of the beautiful architecture that was um, really crowning the top of Mount Pagos um, as a crown. It was kind of structured that way, and it was a gorgeous city, so that's what they called themselves. Smyrna is a wealthy port city with 100,000 citizens. So there was a lot of people there, especially for ancient cities. That's a huge city. It had paved streets with porticos and libraries and theaters and gymnasiums and markets uh, and temples. And they hated Christians, hated them. Okay, and the persecution of the church was vast and intense. So we are going to watch, drive through history, and watch this uh, video of Smyrna. So hit it, Chloe. Next stop on our list, Smyrna. (laughs) 
Smyrna, an ancient city now surrounded by the modern Turkish city of Izmir, was originally established around 1000 BC. Greek settlers established Old Smyrna on this small peninsula jutting out into the Aegean Sea. Now, it was in Old Smyrna that the famous Greek poet Homer, author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, was born around 850 BC. History tells us that a shrine to Homer stood in the city during the Roman period. After the time of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century BC, New Smyrna was built by the Seleucids along the coast and up these slopes of Mount Pagus. Now this region eventually developed into Asia province during the Roman period and Smyrna, strategically located between Ephesus to the south and Pergamum to the north, developed into a wealthy port city. In fact, it was one of the most important cities of the entire province with a population of nearly 100,000 residents. During the Roman period, ancient historians said that Smyrna was a city of great beauty and impressive architecture that circled Mount Pegasus like a crown. There was a great harbor, a massive agora, and a theater on the northwest mountain slope that could hold 20,000 people. This wealthy city was also known for its exceptionally good wine. Smyrna was severely damaged by an earthquake in 178 AD, but was quickly rebuilt. Now the layout of the city we see here today and most of these structures are pretty much the same as they were in the late first century when John was writing. Here's a portion of John's second letter in the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Smyrna writes, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Revelation 2, 8 through 10. Okay, that's Smyrna. Let's dive into it. You guys ready? Okay, we're going to look at verse 8. Number 1 on a letter is what? What's the first stop? Description. Description of Jesus that he assigns to the church, right? The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. That's what Jesus gave to Smyrna. Not only is Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, but he is also the faithful witness. Remember that? Which meant martyr in the Greek. He's the first and the last, the first to lay down his life for the truth of the gospel. Smyrna has a savior who knows their tribulation who knows what they're going through. And Smyrna has a Lord who has the power over life and death because he rose from the grave, right? This is something Smyrna would be cheered to remember because of what they are going through. I am the first, I am the last who died, but death was not the end. I came back to life and they're going to want to know that they're going to want to remember that. Trust me. Okay. So that's the description. Nice and easy. What's the second part? Affirmation. Affirmation. That's in verse nine. So three things the Lord knows about Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. That does not sound good. Okay, so three things the Lord knows about Smyrna. They are what? Tribulation, right? What's the next one? They're poverty, they're poor, right? What else? Okay, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander, right? Three things, tribulation, poverty, and slander. Now, each of these things came to Smyrna from a different group of people. 
This is something you guys might want to mark down, okay? Tribulation came at the hands of the Romans. Poverty came at the hands of the Greeks. Slander came at the hands of the Jews. In other words, they have no allies in Smyrna. Everybody hates them. Romans, Greeks, and Jews. They all hate the church. Now, number one on the list, tribulation, which is trials and hardships that came by the hands of the the Romans. Now, we go through all kinds of trials, don't we? Peter called them various trials or differing trials, right? That's what he says about our trials. We have trials in marriage. We have trials in the workplace. We have trials with our kids. We've got trials in finances. We've got physical trials. We even have spiritual trials. Life is full of trouble and it rains on the just and unjust alike, right? Trouble. In this world, you're going to have trouble. It's a bumper sticker that we don't put on our car, but it's a promise that Jesus gave us. You're going to have trouble. But to the church at Smyrna, Jesus recognized a different tribulation than all that list. These are trials facing the congregation that were brought specifically on because because of their faithfulness to the gospel and for the cause of Christ. This is tribulation brought on specifically because of the gospel. Christians are hated in Smyrna because of the gospel. Why is this? Why is that true? Smyrna was number one on the map for worship of the spirit God of Rome. This Spirit was said to possess the emperors that were in charge of the empire, actually possess them, deifying them, making them God. Okay, the spirit God of Rome possessed them and Smyrna had the temple of the spirit God. That's why people went there. Okay, and this God specifically, like I said, was possessing the emperor. So it's different than what was going on in Ephesus. This is a whole new thing. This is something different. Domitian was the first emperor with the guts to actually demand that he be worshipped as Lord. He's the guy. He's, it had been a while, around for a while, but he's the one who actually enforced it. So how would one worship Domitian or this deified emperor. Well, once a year, you had to go to the temple, bring your family to the temple. You would have to pinch incense, which cost you a fortune and burn it at the, at the altar of the spirit God and declare out loud, Caesar is Lord. That's what you had to do every year. You had to do it. When you were finished doing that, you were handed a certificate. Okay. You got a piece of paper um, that was completed, said that you did it and it was good for a year. And basically this paper was a pass to the city. It was a certificate that gave you a pass to the city without the certificate. A person could not participate in any form of commerce. Dang. Is this, I don't know. Never mind. Shut up for the early church. You guys, for the early church, a nationalistic Christian was an oxymoron to be a patriot to your city and be a believer. You can't be both. You can't be both to declare Jesus as Lord was a political statement. Does that make sense? You can't be a nationalist and follow Jesus Christ in their day. It didn't happen. This was of course a serious problem for the believers. You could imagine. This is a problem, you see. Christians in town under Domitian's rule, they're being destroyed by the droves, by Domitian. Rome was plundering houses, stealing inheritances, and burning homes to the ground. Do you remember that happening with Nero and Peter? You guys remember that? When Rome burned, he came and, and burned everything down, and the church was dispersed. Peter being kind of incognito staying in Rome was sending encouragement to the church that was stuck. Same kind of thing, okay? 
all believers in Smyrna were discriminated against at best, but many were sent to the arena to be fed to the lions, to be fed to the wolf packs, to be crucified. If they denied Caesar or the emperor or anybody else as Lord, if they called Jesus as Lord and didn't say that they were Lord to somebody else. You see, they were sent to their deaths. John, of course, was trapped in the net of Domitian. Domitian is the one who tried to boil him in oil and then sent him to Patmos. Same guy. Okay, so John actually got caught in it as well. So that's the tribulation of the Romans on account of the gospel. Does that make sense? Okay, what's the second one? Poverty at the hands of the Greeks. Greeks. Okay, the Smyrna Christians were treated horribly by the Greeks as well, not just the Romans. Since Rome had taken everything that they had, burned everything that they had, took all their inheritance, the Christians are now left with nothing. And the Greek residents refused to help them out without the certificate. Right? So no landlord would rent them anything. Nobody would sell them any property. They couldn't even go to the grocery store without the certificate that said that they paid tribute to Caesar as Lord. Because of this, many of the Christian families lived in the slums in severe poverty, scraping trash just to survive because they can't shop. They can't get a house. They can't do anything. Do you understand? Without this certificate, there was no place to keep their families safe at night. So while Rome was busy with their persecutions of their own, with the arenas and all this other stuff, the Greeks added a heavy dose of economic persecution on top of it. That's number two. Number three, not only tribulation from the Romans, poverty from the Greeks, but number three is what? From the, from the Jews. Now, long before Jesus came on the scene, there was a colony of national ethnic Jews that lived in Smyrna. They had actually quite a big corner on Smyrna. They lived there, okay? Having fully rejected Jesus Christ as the blasphemer, the one they called the hanged one, that's what they called him, and his followers, the little Christ, or Christians, that's what Christian means, by the way, little Christ, right? The Jews wanted every single one of them dead, gone. Anyone who is not for Christ is against Christ. There's only two teams. Yes? And as a group, they themselves formed, whether they considered it or not, they formed in themselves their own congregation of what the Lord called himself the synagogue of Satan. That's what the Lord called it. Being completely against the Lord, completely rejecting Jesus, and really actually atheists at heart and hating the church, they were actually instruments in the hand of Satan to destroy the bride of Christ. And Jesus is the one who called them the synagogue of Satan. That's, that's blunt. You see, they were on the enemy's team. In fact, the Jews in Smyrna collaborated with the Romans quite often to point out those who belonged to the way and actually help drag them to the arenas. Remember uh, Saul? Then Paul? Same gig. They were helping the Romans out, you see. These Jews having rejected the Messiah are as lost as any Gentile. Now, one martyr, which you may know his name, Polycarp. Okay, if you guys studied Smyrna at all, Polycarp comes up a lot because he was pretty famous as a martyr in Smyrna. He and John were really good friends, and actually Polycarp was John's... Uh, was John's disciple. John actually brought him up. Okay? And actually, Polycarp ended up being a pastor 
in Smyrna. He's kind of what they called Bishop of Smyrna is what they called them at the time. Okay, so that's, that's him. At Polycarp's martyrdom in AD 55, 155, the Jews joined the Romans in the mob's cry to send Polycarp to the lions. When that didn't happen, they called for him to be burnt alive instead. And historians tell us that the Jews are the ones who actually gathered all the wood and made the pile. The Jews, not the Romans, the Jews. You see, they hated believers that much. So Jesus to Smyrna, he writes, I know, I know what you're going through. He says, I know what you're going through. Tribulation at the hands of the Romans. Poverty and discrimination at the hands of the Gentiles. Slanders at the hands of the Jews. I know about that. Didn't he? Yes, he did. Isn't that exactly what happened to Jesus? He says, I Know that. I know all about that. I know your tribulation. Aren't you glad that we have a high priest who knows our tribulation, our trials, our heartache, our trouble? When Jesus says he understands, it's not a platitude and it's not empty sympathy. He actually does know. I know that. Roman tribulation on account of the gospel, been there. Discrimination from the Gentiles, got it. Slander from the Jews, nailed it. I know this. I know this one. And he's telling Smyrna that. Hebrews 2.17, jot this down. Therefore, listen to what he says. Listen to the words. Therefore, he had to be made like his brother's. Listen to what he says. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the servants of God. He had to. That's what Hebrews says. He had to be made that way so that he could sympathize, empathize with us. He had to do it that way. That's what it says. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he has. Right? He is the one who bears the load of our heartache and persecutions. I'll take it, he says. I'll take it. Question. The Smyrna church was impoverished greatly due to the persecution by the Romans who burn all their stuff, by the Greeks who wouldn't let them buy new stuff, right? They were dirt poor. Something in America we don't get dirt poor like anywhere else in the world. They lived in the slums of nothing, you see. Yet Jesus said they were rich. How is that true? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, rich in spirit. That's right. That's right. Rich in spirit. So Matthew 6, 19 through 21. I think you guys had this in your homework. I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 6, it says, you guys, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. You guys, in a very small, very minuscule, very, very tiny way, we in the Rogue Valley know what it means to not count on treasures. Because we've had many friends, many loved ones who have lost their houses very recently right here. Right? And so we can sympathize a little bit with what Smyrna is going through. Jesus says, listen, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't do it where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up instead for yourselves treasures in heaven because there moth and rust, nothing destroys. Thieves can't touch it. You see for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also because their treasure was laid up with Jesus Christ. They were rich 
in their hearts, in their spirit, they were wealthy in the things that mattered. You see, no matter, they didn't own nothing. They didn't own anything, but they were rich in a real way. First Peter chapter one, verse three through five. Listen to what Peter says. Remember in context, Peter is in Rome, hiding underground, writing to the church as Rome burns over his head that is scared, terrified in Rome and also to the ones that are running for their lives, right? This is what he said. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a, a living hope, a hope that lives. Why does our hope live? Because our hope is in Jesus Christ, a living hope. Check this out. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You have a living hope that's protected in the person of Jesus Christ that is imperishable, doesn't go anywhere. It's undefiled. Nobody can get their grummy hands on it. It's unfading. It doesn't rust. Doesn't rust. It doesn't fade, right? Kept or guarded is the word in heaven for you. That's why we're rich. You see, our inheritance is in the living hope and he's the one who's watching out for it, making sure it's all there when we show up. That's our living hope, you see. That's what made the church in Smyrna rich. Now, the next thing on our list after affirmation, what's next? Direction. Direction. Right. Verse 10. Direction. I got to get back there now. Verse 10 says this. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. For 10 days, you will have tribulation. So two directions. What are they? Number one, do not fear. That shows up a lot in the Bible, right? Do not fear. What's the second one? Be faithful even to the end. Like, and that means death. That's what that means. Be faithful even to the death. So number one, do not fear the tribulation. This persecution that's coming to you on account of the gospel. Remember, that's specifically what he's talking about in that word tribulation. Persecution because of the gospel of Christ. What persecution? Well, apparently they're going to get caught and they're going to get thrown into prison. Jesus says, I'll just give it to you. You're going down. Now, prison in the first century and actually for a while after was not a place where you like um, did a sentence and got out. That's not prison. Prison was a holding cell awaiting your persecution. That's all prison was. You don't come out alive. That's it. Okay. You weren't expected to be released. So Smyrna, Jesus says, while you're in there, be faithful unto death. He's giving it to them, you guys. This is going to be their end. Notice Jesus did not promise that they would escape the tribulation. Did it say that anywhere? No, it doesn't. Actually, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Sometimes we do, but it's not promised, right? He did not promise that they were going to make it out. He didn't even say they were going to make it out alive. In fact, it says, be faithful unto death. For many believers, martyred would be the end. That would be on their plaque. Martyred, dying for the cause of Christ. This is the persecution the persecuted church. I mean, this rubs us wrong, right? We're like, ah, that's not really what it means. It's probably not that bad. Yes, this is the persecuted church. Don't skirt around it. They're going to die. That's what the Lord said. Jesus, knowing that, knowing that, told them, 
gird up, be ready, stay strong, be faithful to your final breath because you, my love, you're coming home. That's what he's telling Smyrna. You're going to see me. It's going to be soon. This was their blueprint. The story that the Lord wrote for their lives, for this church, for these saints, this was their blueprint, you guys. Remember on the shore after the resurrection when Peter's like, I'm going fishing. And they're like, yeah, me too. And they all get in the boat. Remember that? And then all that stuff happened, right? And Jesus restores Peter. And then the end, we talked about this in the very start when we were talking about John, how Peter was told of his end, that he would be crucified. Remember that? And Peter did not like that. That is not the blueprint Peter wanted. And he's like, what about him? Remember that? (laughs) And pointed at John or sorry, the beloved disciple or sorry, the one that leaned to the left on Jesus or whatever it was to John, right? And Jesus said, don't worry about him. I'm telling you to follow the blueprint. You follow me, Peter. You see, remember that? Remember that whole story? For one, there was one blueprint. For another, there was another blueprint, you guys, and we don't decide. We don't decide the blueprint. John had one. Peter had one. And Peter's ended really brutally and young, early, you see. For Smyrna, they had a blueprint. Okay, so don't skirt around the blueprint. It just is. Now, speaking of of Polycarp, right? Remember, he's the martyr. Jews did the firewood thing. Remember him? Now, the Roman guards came to his house to pick him up, to take him to jail, where he would go immediately to the arena because you don't get out of jail. You just go, you die. Okay, so the Romans, they show up. They actually liked Polycarp. They, that's what histor- history tells us. They didn't actually want to do anything to him. So the Roman guards, they plead with Polycarp, actually. And this is what they said. Uh, what harm is it to say Caesar is Lord? Just say it, dude. Just, you don't even have to mean it. Just say it. They so badly did not want to take him to the arena. They're like, dude, just I won't tell. Just say it and we'll go away. You see, but he refused. He wouldn't do it. In the arena, they got him there. The pro council also kind of favored Polycarp and gave him another chance. Dude, right here, right now, I'll let you fix it. Denounce that Jesus is Lord, say Caesar is Lord, pinch an incense, throw it in, you'll get out of here, you see. Right now, I'll let you do it. This is what the old pastor Polycarp said, quote, 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? That's what he said. What makes you a believer in Jesus? Not an American Christian. Not just lip service Christian. What actually makes you a believer in Jesus? This is getting less and less popular. If you confess with your mouth. Remember this? If you confess with your mouth, that is to openly, publicly declare him Lord. Your Lord. Your king, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you declare Jesus is Lord and mean it, as in you take yourself off the throne of your life and you put Jesus on the throne of your life, that is what makes you saved, you guys. Lord. Lord, you see. Y'all, it's easy to declare Jesus Savior. It really is. We love that part. We do. That he died, that he's our deliverer, that we don't have to go to hell. We love that part. 
But to declare him as Lord is a whole nother thing. To declare him as Lord, making Jesus Lord of your life is to hand the sovereignty of your life over into his hands, relinquishing all your plans, all your opinions, all your design, whatever you want and say, thy will be done. My life belongs to you. You are king. You are Lord. That's what is making, that's making Jesus Lord of your life. That's what it means, you see. Lord, to make him Lord. And no matter what blueprint he draws for you, you say, thy will be done. That's putting your sovereignty, relenting your sovereignty into the hand of the Lord. You see, and for Smyrna, Martyr was the final chapter of their story. That's their blueprint. What is the reward? Look at verse, uh, whatever it is. Crown of, Crown of life. That's right. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life, right? And verse 11, it says, he who has an ear. Remember last week we mentioned that this letter, John didn't write seven copies of Revelation. It's one scroll that went to every church, remember? So it had gone to Ephesus. Now it's headed to Smyrna, but he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the churches. We're supposed to take it all in from everybody. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. death. Okay. Where Smyrna was a crown, they they said that they were a crown, right? The crowning glory of Asia. Everything was in a crown, like they were really stuck on themselves, right? Lots of pride. But it really was a crown of death for the saints. But that crown of death would bring to them the crown of life. Or another way that people say the crown of life is the martyr's crown. It's also called that because it's given to this church that would die on account of the gospel. Now, the Bible explains that there's two deaths. This is important because it says you're going to get out of the second death. You're like, well, what the heck is that? You know, what is that? There's two deaths. There's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. Unless if you're Elijah or Enoch... We're all going to do the second death thing, right? (laughs) Even Jesus, or yeah, the physical death, right? Which is actually the first death. I put them in the wrong order. Physical death, we're all going to go through that. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. (laughs) I didn't mean to do that. Everybody dies, okay? That's the first death. Everybody, saint, sinner, everybody's going to die unless we get raptured or something. Okay. But generally, but then there's a second death, which is the death of the soul. Because though we die physically, our spirit does not die. We only die once. Does that make sense? And we go straight to eternal life. Our soul lives on. Now everybody's soul lives on, but our soul lives to eternal life. The second death is talking about those who die physically, but they're also spiritually dead. And they are condemned because of that. Does that make sense? So what's Jesus saying? Listen, you are going to be hurt by the first death. It's coming for you, Smyrna. You're going to die on behalf, um, because of the gospel. But you're going to have a crown of life. And that second death, that's not yours. You're sailing right into eternal life. It's a promise of eternal life again, just like Ephesus got. But this, this crew gets a crown. Now, there's five crowns in the Bible, which if you stick with us for part two of Revelation, we're going to go into all of those and how you can earn them and why we care. Because no one wants a crown. Technically, we think, yes, you do. You want every single one of them. This one's harder to get, (laughs) but that's okay. Okay, crown of life. So that's all that it's saying with this second death is that there's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. If you belong to Jesus, you only go through the one. And then you live on, you see. So that's what it's talking about. True believers, 
you guys, who lose their life here will step into eternal life immediately to live forever, never tasting that second death. Your last exhale here is your first inhale there. That fast. <sighs> into the new life, into eternal life. It's as quick as that, you see. Exhale to the inhale, and that's what they're saying in Smyrna. Oh no, your exhale here will be inhale in the presence of Jesus. You're going, you're going there with the crown of life stuck on your head. How does this apply to us? I'm going to read, you guys flip there, John 15, flip there. I always say this, but I like to bring this up anytime I'm in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17 of John, because the context makes it always so much powerful to me to remember that Jesus had just left the upper room on that last Passover, right? And he is cramming the last things that he can into these boys. I mean, just shoving it in there as fast as he can because he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. So he's leaving the Passover. He's walking through Jerusalem, through the East Gate, into the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's just rapid fire these last instructions and encouragements as fast as he can. And that's where you find chapter 15. So imagine him in the middle of the night with his boys walking through the streets of Jerusalem, through the East Gate, into the Kidron Valley, and he's talking, talking, talking. And that's the context of where we are at. So he had just done the, I am the vine, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. We, I think we talked about that last week right? Abide in me. Now, verse 18 comes. If the world hates you, <laughs> know that it has hated me before it hates you. Where is he? He's on the way to the, to the cross, right? He's about to get arrested in about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If the world hates you, know that it hated me. You were of the world. You used to belong here. The world would love you as its own. If you belong to the world, the world would love you. You'd be on that team. That's what Jesus is saying. Because you are not of this world, but I have chose you out of this world. Therefore, the world hates you. Hates you. you guys, this is another bumper sticker. The world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me or my father. They don't know the father. Look at 16, chapter 16, verse 1. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues, you guys. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. That's what they're going to think. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you, the Holy Spirit. And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will do what? Convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. The Holy Spirit is who will convict the world, you see, when I leave. The Holy Spirit. Persecution is a promise, you guys. It will happen. It's not if, it's when. That's, that's all there is to it. The world hates truth and light because these are the very fingerprints of God. They hate it, you see, because in this light and truth, 
they reject it because if they acknowledged it, they would be acknowledging the Lord. They have to do something with him if they acknowledge light and truth. Since the Holy Spirit lives in us as a conduit that illuminates truth and exposes the dark, the world hates us. We who are the housing of the light of the world. And if they killed the light of the world, they are going to kill those who display the light as well. That's what Jesus is saying. Just take it to the bank. Why is he saying that? It sounds like such a downer. It's not. It's an encouragement because they're going to be hated. No one likes to be hated, you guys. It's hard. Smyrna had no allies on any side of the fence. They were absolutely hated. But was it them that they hated? Jesus says, no, it's not. It's me that they hate. And because you are little Christ, the bearers of Jesus Christ, they hate you because you are carrying around truth and light and me. It's actually me that they hate. It actually is like, oh, okay, a little bit. Yes? Right? I mean, it's not really me, it's you. <laughs> you know, kind of like that. We have a treasure in jars of clay. Who's a jars of clay? Me, I guess. I definitely am a crackpot. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else. In context, there, before in chapter 4, he just got through telling us that it was the gospel, right? We have this treasure, which is the gospel. We're the housing of the gospel in these really broken vessels that we've got. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We, though, are afflicted in every way, but are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, or in us is the gospel, right? The body of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Listen, we have the gospel in jars of clay, and because of this, we're going to get beat up. We're going to get beat up. We're not going to be destroyed. We're not going to be forsaken. We're not going to despair, but we are going to get run over by a Mack truck. Yes, we are. It's a promise. Take it to the bank, you see. The fire is coming. It is coming. Remember that promise of our living hope? and forever inheritance in first Peter right after that. If you guys can turn fast, if not listen to this, it's the very next verse. It tells us that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power, it's being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at verse six in this. You rejoice though. Now for a little while, if, necessary you have been grieved by various trials there it is all these diverse kinds of trials right why because god's mean because we're ants under a magnifying glass what is it why so that verse 7 the tested genuineness of your faith you guys, mark this. Listen, listen up. Now for a little while, if necessary, you're going to go through a whole lot of crap. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, your faith that is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why you go through stuff. 
that the tested genuineness of your faith that is worth all the gold and all the land would be found to the glory and honor when Jesus comes and gets us. That's why, you guys. That's why we go through it. In these last days, you guys, in this post-Christian era, which how did we get here? We're here though. Okay, this post-Christian era in this cancel culture that we're in, where wrong is right and right is silenced. This thing that we're in where sin is celebrated, where moral ground has completely dissolved. It's gone. In these last days, the Bible tells us hostility will rise against those who hold fast to the immovable standard of truth and light and righteousness. If you hold to the truth and the light and righteousness, they're gonna get you. Which is going to weed out those who do not call Jesus Lord. You guys, this is a tough night. I'll probably go to jail. That's fine. (laughs) That's just the truth. It's just the truth, you see. No country, no country is exempt. Not even this one. It's coming, you guys. It is a blessing. It has been a blessing that America has enjoyed the freedom of religion that it has. It is absolutely God's favor upon this nation that we've been able to do what we've been able to do here. And that we have identified with Christianity for so long. But perhaps now, right now, as that foundation that we love is shifting beneath our feet at such a rapid rate, our sheltered faith has made for a shallow allegiance to the king of the coming kingdom. We just don't have to use our faith muscles that much. Here, the fire is coming. Why? Because, you guys, faith steals up in the fire. We need it really bad. You see, the hotter the flame, the stronger the resolution of our faith. That's what Peter said. You got to blaze that thing. You got to throw it in the cooker. Your faith will be frail and fragile unless if you throw it in the kiln in high heat and then it comes out as something that's gold and lasts, you see. I'm talking just generally in America. We need the fire. We're not going to make it, you see. This faith needs to be steeled up in the flames. The only way that faith is strengthened is in the fire. It's the way it's designed. That's how God designed faith. It's everywhere. That's not the only verse about it. Faith is refined through the fire. The only way to turn faith into gold is to throw it in the pressure cooker. That's how you do it. There's no other way. You guys, today, churches and Christians around the world are under severe persecution, but they are strong and unbending. They do not flinch. They just don't flinch, you guys. They have endured unto the death today, right now, happily. Rejoicing that they got to drink the same cup of suffering as Jesus Christ himself. Lining up to do it. How did they get there? Years and years and years of the fire. Their faith is strong. They have to. You see. And in the bearing of the crown of death, they will receive the crown of life. They are alive Even as they take their last breath, they've never been more alive when they wake up with Jesus Christ, you see. Smyrna was a church 
under fire. The persecuted church, their final refinement, their final test was the one that earned them the crown of life. Death. We in America have never been tested like that. Never, never, never. But it's coming. But it's coming, you guys. What if we are? Should the Lord tarry, what if we do? Smyrna means myrrh. We talked about that, right? It's this rather ugly bush that is bitter if you eat it. It's nasty, okay? It's actually the root word mara, which is in twice in the Old Testament. One for the water that was so bitter that made everybody grumpy, right? Like they're grumpy all the time. But it was bitter. And then the other one is Naomi nodding back to that, called herself bitter. Remember that? She tried to rename herself and Ruth's like, get it together. Mara, right? So this bitterness. But if you mix the leaves and the sap with oil and you crush, I mean, just pulverize the snot out of it and made it this paste, a perfume, the fragrance is something that is beautiful and sweet and they sell it today myrrh it's a burial perfume right jesus was anointed with myrrh he was crushed he was pulverized you guys but he rose in this sweet fragrance jesus did sweet fragrance rises in the crushing smyrna and because they were crushed and pulverized, this church at Smyrna, they were perfumed with the fragrance of Christ wherever they went. Fun fact, out of all seven churches that John wrote to, the seven churches of Asia Minor, Smyrna is the only church that survives today. Smyrna is still there. This church, this far out, still there. Why? That's some real faith right there, Smyrna had. They're still there today. Every other church went down, every single one, except for Smyrna. I want to end with a video that falls woefully short of its intention, I assure you. It does no justice on what I wanted to do. But I hope that it reminds us to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who tonight are losing their lives for the cause of Christ as we sit here. And I hope it reminds us to pray for the American church, our brothers and sisters. And if that's too broad, whoever is in your room right now, we have got to pray for each other, you guys. The fire is coming. If the Lord tarries, it's going to get worse. And those who hold fast to the truth are the ones that are going to be persecuted. They hate us. It bumps against everything they're trying to leave unexposed in the dark. When we walk into the room, we don't even have to say anything. The Holy Spirit within us convicts them just because we're in proximity. You see, that's what Jesus said. You don't have to say anything. They're just mad at you. You see, we need to pray for each other. Even perhaps the refiner's fire now in small ways to steal us up for whatever it is the Lord has written into our blueprints that we don't know about. Whatever it is, and thy will be done. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's a big statement, but that's making Jesus Lord, you see. And we have no idea what's in our blueprint. And we want to have faith that's resolute to be able to withstand against whatever it is. Various trials, little trials, tribulation for the gospel, whatever it is, we need to have faith that's steeled up. You see, and when trials come, when we suffer, may we do it with the fragrance of Christ. You see, 
that our faith refined as gold would be found to his glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what we want. Asia Bibi, the Catholic woman set free by a Pakistani court on blasphemy charges, says she still fears for her life. The country's Supreme Court is weighing a petition from Islamic extremists who want her executed. According to a new report, she's not the only one. The persecution of Christians is on the rise around the world. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has details from the State Department. The Christian advocacy group Open Doors USA says 30 million more Christians experienced persecution compared to last year. Many of them are worried they'll be forgotten. This Christian woman tells me she lives a life of fear. Hannah is wearing a burqa because she doesn't want anyone to see her face or know her real name and country. She's from South Asia, where blasphemy laws could result in her going to jail or even death. Imagine walking down a corridor and the walls around you beginning to come in on you and the, the path that you're walking on constantly shifting, constantly changing. And that's the life of a, of a secret believer. That's the life of a Christian. Hannah is a teacher but she says she can't teach what is good and true. She's forced to use biased textbooks, which paint non-Muslims as second-class citizens. From the very earliest days of their exposure to, to studies, to academics, to, to learning, they are already being reminded, if, if they're Christian, they're being reminded that there's no place for you here. Christians around the world are facing the same persecution, according to Open Doors USA. Their annual watch list identifies the worst violators of religious freedom. North Korea is number one again, but so are many countries in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. David Curry is the group's president. Essentially what we see is more governments using laws and their police force to control, and in some cases seeking to eliminate the expression of Christian faith. Hannah prays that won't happen and asks everyone to do the same. So pray that the Spirit of God would remind us that we are not forgotten and that we are part of a communion of saints and a cloud of witnesses who is ever glorifying his name. Another disturbing trend according to Open Doors, more governments are starting to use technology like facial recognition to spy on Christians. China has asked for cameras to be installed in churches so officials can monitor the people in the pews. The majority of the countries where there is persecution, you see that there is a lot of poverty. They don't have enough to eat. They don't have a place to sleep. They have their houses bombed, burned, their wives killed, their moms killed, their fathers killed. From the youngest to the oldest, they slash pregnant women. They slash them, take the babies out of the womb. I mean, can you imagine? And you have the husband watching this. You have all the kids being wrenched away from their family. It hurts. The persecution is real. There's been a tremendous step up in violence and harassment and oppression of Christians in every region of the world. It's governments using their police force, their border control, to bring pressure on Christian communities around the world. It's not a series of incidents. It's a massive wave of persecution. There's a true story of a small village in India. And in this village, there was this family that came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This agitated the village so much and everybody became so upset that an angry mob gathered and shoved them into the public square. The village chief confronted them and he said to the man, if you and your family will not recant your faith, you all will surely die. The man didn't know what to say or what to do. And so the only thing that came to mind for him were the words of a song that he himself had composed when he had first surrendered his life to God. And so he began to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And with that, horrifically, his children were killed. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus
Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. He was given another chance this time with his wife's life on the line. And yet he continued to sing, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I Turning back, no turning back. After her tragic death, he was given one final opportunity, this time to save himself. And yet he continued to sing. Even though that man and his family died on that day, something remarkable happened. A seed was planted in the heart of that village chief, a seed that began to grow over time and eventually he called the community together in that very same neighborhood, in that very same square, and he renounced his former faith and declared his allegiance to Jesus Christ. And a celebration broke out in that moment and the gospel began to flourish and to grow in that community, not just in that village, but across the whole region. Because they had seen real faith and they knew the true character of God because of a family that believed and sacrificed even under the penalty of death.